Revelation chapter 10. We'll come back to chapter 9 uh, next Wednesday. I'm going ahead to Revelation chapter 10 now. We still will look at the sixth trumpet, which finishes chapter 6. And from 13 on down, we're going to jump into chapter 10 and cover chapter 10 right now. Chapter 10, starting there in verse 1, all 11 verses. And so it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he said, and he, uh, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things with the, which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the earth, and the things that are therein, and the earth, and, and the things that are therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me, and again said, Go and take the little book which, uh, which is open in the hand of the angel, and standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly ask for your blessing upon this service tonight. Lord, I pray that you help me not to get in the way of it. Lord, I pray that the truths that we see here would help us. Lord, that they would draw us closer to you. Lord, that would give us an understanding of what's going to take place and allow that to motivate us. Uh, Lord, please and meet the different needs of the hearts that are here. I pray that you'd bless and work. I pray this time would not be in vain, but Lord, you would use it in a way that would be help to us and to our church. And Lord, if there is anyone here who is apart from Christ, we certainly do pray for their salvation, Lord. Please bless and work. Father, I pray for that, Lord. I love you, and I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. As we come into chapter 10, it's, it's a parenthetical chapter. We, chapter 9 finishes with the sixth trumpet. The seventh one is yet to sound. We'll get to the seventh one introduced in chapter 11, right around, I think it's right around verse 15 or so there when we get into, the, uh, into, into that aspect of it. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, really, all the way up until chapter 15 is pretty much parenthetical. It's giving us information that is taking place during this tribulation time. And then once we get back into chapter 15, it's going to pick up what happens after that seventh trumpet sounds, and we go from there. Um, again, we've already seen the earth has had massive judgment upon it. We've seen the first four trumpets have taken place where a third of the earth, uh, of, the, of the salt water, the fresh water, and all the earth was affected by a third of the sun losing its power. We then looked at the fifth trumpet, which we literally saw hell released on earth. We got into great detail about the demons that were released that had been enslaved. These were the demons that had crossed lines before God. These were demons that went too far with their oppression of men. That had crossed certain lines that were never meant to be crossed. And the Lord had enough of it and he imprisoned them. But we see during this time in the tribulation, when that fifth trumpet is open, the Lord releases all of them upon the earth. And the torture of men, how it describes the sting of the scorpion, that they had teeth like a lion. And how it did not, and I tried to develop how it did not deal with people looking around seeing scorpion-like creatures with horses rushing around in the air, stinging men. But it dealt with the possession of their souls and what was going to be taking place by these vile, vile creatures that were released from hell. And the amount of time, God gave them a cent amount of time that they could work their torture upon the earth. And so, as we've noticed from the very beginning, from the seals being opened, 
to the trumpets, and then we're going to be getting into the vials here. Uh, that'll be a few weeks out because of covering these parenthetical chapters right now. But it gets much, much, much worse. The judgment is significant. Again, so we come into chapter 10, and we're going to get some additional information here that is taken, and really is an amazing chapter. Now, before, when we get, more, just by way of introduction of this, before Kepler and, uh, who, was the other, who was the other astronomer there? Uh, Copernicus, is that his name? Before Kepler and them, they used to think that the earth was the center of everything, that everything revolved around the earth. Um, what is that? Geocentricity. Uh, the, the, the belief in that, that the earth was, there's still some people that still believe that to, today, which boggles the mind, but nonetheless, um, that was a common belief until Kepler. Kepler proved that that was not the case, that everything revolved around, in our galaxy, revolved around the sun. Well, there's so many parallels there between the problems in the earth and, and that same philosophy. Too often, everybody wants to think that the world revolves around them. That the world is the center of everything, when really everything revolves around the sun. And chapter 10 is the Lord Jesus Christ reminding the world, the world is not the center of everything. He is. <clears throat> many people wonder, I don't know how many times I've heard it, even claim, not even wonder, even claim they don't even believe in God because evil exists. They see suffering and whatnot, and they say, there, how could there possibly be a God with the evil when evil exists? By the way, the fact that evil exists is a, a proof of a creator. We can actually draw that out to show the fact that evil exists literally does prove the existence of a creator. It gives a baseline to morality. It speaks to a moral conscience of knowing something is wrong. Again, where does that come from? Where does the idea of something that is good and something that is evil come from if we're just from nothing? That side has nothing to do with the message. But again, some say because of all the suffering, all the evil, how could there possibly be a God if there is a God? Why doesn't He intervene? Why doesn't He do something to stop it? I mean, there's wars, there's disease, there's sickness. Why doesn't He intervene? Why does He allow suffering? Men have been begging God to intervene. Even the prophets in the Old Testament, Habakkuk would cry out, Oh Lord, how long, how long? Wanting God to intervene. See Him the suffering, the misery, and the sin that was taking place. Zechariah would cry, how long? How long? Begging God to intervene at looking at all that was taking place. We too see all the corruption that is in the earth, all the sorrow that is there, all the brokenness. We look at what's taking place in our political system. Again, all the wickedness that is in the world. We too can begin to wonder, how long? Well, the fact is the day is coming when all of God's plans comes to fruition. When He straightens out this world entirely, when there is no more suffering, when there is no more corruption, when justice is, is put out, when there is no more wickedness, when Satan and every single one of his demons are bound. The day is, this day, now understand this, that very day when God does directly intervene to cease all of that is tied to the seventh trumpet. It's tied to the seventh trumpet. <clears throat> Take a look over in Revelation chapter 11 when the seventh trumpet, is, seventh trumpet is sounded. This is important because what takes place in chapter 10 has everything to do with the seventh trumpet. Let's start in verse 14. Remember the three woes that were told to us in, in, in chapter 9. All right, we've already, dealt, we've already dealt with one of those. But let's jump over here. And it says, the second woe is past. We'll get to that when we get there. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. And there was great voices in heaven. Now, notice what the response is to this one immediately. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which are before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give Thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because Thou hast taken to Thee Thy great power and hast reigned. And nations, and the nations were angry. 
and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, and they that should be judged, and, the, and thou shalt give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to, thy, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, shouldest destroy them which should destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were two lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. The seventh trumpet is what is going to usher in. The events associated with the seventh trumpet will usher in, literally, the kingdom on this earth. Of all the prophecies, all that's been taking place in Scripture, all that's going to begin to come to pass quickly when the seventh trumpet sounds. All the mystery, all the prophecies, it's all going to be fulfilled. And it's all connected to the seventh trumpet. It's at that time that righteousness will rule. The curse will be lifted from the earth. What sin, what sin did change? We're going to see the reality of, of Romans, concluding chapter 5, going into chapter 6, where, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. We're going to see the desert will bloom. We're going to see there's going to be no more war. When God puts in place what was intended from the very beginning, the completion of His plan. Every single mocker of God will be silenced. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what the seventh trumpet is going to usher in. When we get to Revelation chapter 10, remember, John is literally transported in time. He, he is taken to the, to the time when, when the tribulation is taking place. He's seen it happen. He's seen what's unfolding during those seven years and even prior to it, what's leading up to it. And what, what we see in, take, at, at chapter 10, you know, it's parenthetical, giving us more information. It is what takes place right before the seventh trumpet is about to sound. Because that will usher in the end of God's plan and all prophecy that has been given. So chapter 10 serves literally as a symbol of what is about to take place. God is letting the world know what's getting ready to happen. He is taking over, and Satan's time is done. So let's get into the chapter now. <clears throat> I'm going to break this down into about three different areas. First, we need to look at this mighty angel that comes down from heaven. It says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So we have a description here of this angel that comes down from heaven, and we, we need to understand who this angel is. Many, a lot of good men who I respect greatly had concluded that this is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And there certainly are some proofs in the text to that end. It says He's arrayed in a cloud. Revelation 1.7, when John has his vision of Jesus Christ, what's he coming in? He's coming in the clouds. It says his face is like the sun. We see the same thing in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, when John has his vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says his feet as pillars of fire. We see the same thing in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 15 again, with John's vision of Jesus Christ. We also see because of the book he is holding in, in verse 2, it is said to be, and I, I agree with that completely, it is the book from Revelation chapter 5 and verse 7. And we'll look at that here in a few minutes. Which was a book that Jesus Christ himself took from the Father. I think there's a possibility this is Jesus Christ, but I really doubt that it's him. For a few reasons that I just cannot get by when looking at the text. So let's look at why this is unlikely to be Jesus Christ. First off is the fourth word. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. The word another here is very important. It means literally, there's, there's two Greek words you can use to get the word another. This one means of the same kind. This is another literally of the same kind. So he's talking about the other mighty angels. We've seen several of them given to, introduced to us already in the book of Revelation. Remember, in the introduction to this book, we discussed briefly uh, the prominence of angels throughout the book of Revelation. So we are introduced to several different mighty angels, from Michael, Gabriel, others that we see around the throne. 
And this in context is saying that this angel that John has seen is like unto those of the same sort. That alone lets me know that this cannot be Jesus Christ. Again, this is equating this angel with other mighty angels we have seen. Christ is not simply another angel. He is God. Again, I just can't see John, as we've went through this book, and him having how he recorded it, and what he saw in Scripture, as referring to the Lord Jesus Christ as another angel. Not one time in the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ referred to as an angel. Not one time. John always identified Christ as the Lord Jesus Christ in this book. He is never veiled. It's never hidden. After all, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Another problem with it would be the fact that the angel comes down out of heaven and touches his feet on the earth. One foot on the sea, one foot on the ground. Scripturally speaking, Jesus Christ made it clear the next time he returns to the earth, it is the second coming. This is not the second coming right here. <clears throat> so, this is most likely exactly simply what the text says. A mighty angel, a strong angel, very powerful angel created by God that we are introduced to. A whole nother one. Again, it deals with this beauty that is here, but yet we see that throughout. We can compare here, and I think of another angel who was created in great beauty in the Scripture, Lucifer. And the splendor and the glory that he had in creation. It's not unusual for God to have made some angels that were separate, that were apart with amazing power and amazing beauty. We're simply being introduced to another one right here. This is clearly a very high-ranking angel in God's hierarchy when He created them. And again, we see strong angels, mighty angels throughout this book. It says that He is crowned with a rainbow. Again, the first time we're introduced to rainbows with the flood. A symbol that God would never destroy the earth again by water. That this would not happen again. I think the rainbow here, even though it's dealing with the massive judgment that is coming... It also shows grace. In verse 2, we're given another detail about this angel when he comes down, to, comes down from heaven. It says, in his hand, And he had in his hand a little book open. He has this little book in his hand. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 5. Let's see what book it's talking about here. The fact that it's open is the key. Revelation chapter 5, starting in, let's start in verse 1. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Just wondering if that's not the same angel we're being introduced in chapter 10. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, uh, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne... And of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And then as we know, as we get in the rest of the chapter, it is when that first seal is open of this scroll that begins the tribulation. It is, it is what starts all these events taking place. When the seventh seal is broken open, that leads to everything else in this book. And all those seals have already been opened by the time we get to chapter, by the time we get to chapter 10. It is now an open seal, open book. It is also the exact same word used between Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 10. <clears throat> I believe all this points to the fact that this is the exact same book we're seeing in chapter 10, is this book, which when we looked at again, this was the title deed to the earth. 
We know that because of all that it unleashes and what we, what we even seen there in Revelation chapter 11 of what I just read. It is, it is what God is using. It is what had been sealed up from the fall of man on, that this is what God would use to straighten all this out and intervene and take it back and stop his silence, if you will. And in the wickedness and in the suffering and in the corruption, this is what would signify. This is what would signify him taking back what is his. All of the universe is his through, of course, uh, creation itself. Not only that in Scripture, but also because of redemption. But since the fall, God has allowed Satan to have dominion. But this is what ends it. <clears throat> now we get into the purpose of the angel from the latter half of verse 2 down through verse 7. Let's take a look at those verses now. <clears throat> it says, And he set his right foot upon the earth, and his left foot, uh, uh, or excuse me, his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things with the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that are, which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and he began to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. We're getting into the purpose now of this. The angel comes down from heaven, and he places one foot on the, uh, uh, his, his, uh, uh, um, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land. This, this it's, the action that's taking place here is very symbolic of what God is getting ready to do. It's a real action, but God is using it as a symbol of what's getting ready to take place. It is the symbolism of what God will accomplish when the seventh trumpet is sounded. And again, the seventh trumpet is getting ready to sound. We know that, of course, verse 6 is diving into that, or, 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 or verse 7 of the seventh trumpet getting ready to sound. What is taking place is this. The angel of the Lord is now, uh, uh, um, the angel is proclaiming the fact that the Lord is now taking back all of creation, all of the universe from Satan. That the time is now. The roar and the thundering showing God's great power and authority, proclaiming strongly that this is now the end. Once the seventh trumpet sounds, things are going to progress rapidly all the way up in time till Jesus Christ himself returns. And it is this proclamation, before it sounds, the angel comes down, and with a roar, letting it be known. Now I'm intervening. When this one is concluded, the earth is mine. Satan will be bound, his demons will be bound, justice will be there, corruption will be gone, wickedness will be gone. It's God intervening. We see this talked about in Jeremiah chapter 25. Let me read there. If you want to go there, you can read a couple of or just two verses in Jeremiah chapter 25. <clears throat> verses 29 and 30. Jeremiah saw this day coming. He says, For lo, I begin to bring an evil on the city which is called by my name, and, and, and should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall, uh, he shall give a shout. And they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. And you know, it continues from there. Jeremiah saw it coming when this great war would happen. That would signify the judgments that would take place. When it was concluded, Christ's kingdom would be here. And again, it's, the time is so short when this is here. It's just, it, it, it's, it's on the brink now. It, it's, it's there. Again, John hears the seven th thunders utter their voices. He goes to write it down because that's what he's instructed to do. You go back to chapter 1. He was told, you're going to write down what you see. So John hears whatever those seven thundering voices have said, and he starts to go to write it down. And he stopped immediately from a voice in heaven. He said, no, this doesn't get written down. 
This you're not writing. These things are sealed up. You're not writing this. Don't write any of it down. There are certain things that God doesn't want us to know. Um, you know, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children, that we, that we may do all these words of the law forever. So there's something here, really, it's kind of fearful. I, 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 we, it's a speculation of what it is, but considering the context, I think it's reasonable to assume that it does have to deal with judgments that are going to be coming. And he says, nope, I, I don't know if it's because they're too terrible or, or, or what the deal was. He said, you're not writing those down. But again, there's certain things that God wants us to know and other things he does not want us to know. But what he does provide for us to know is exactly what we need to know. Then the angel does something interesting. I also think it's an indication that it's not Jesus Christ. Some say it could be still because of Hebrews, I don't remember, chapter 6, where when the Lord can swear by no greater, swear by himself. But I don't think that's what we see here taking place. We have an angel who basically swears before heaven. Puts his hand up, which is the act of taking a vow. And he swears by heaven. He swears, basically he's concluding with what, what is everything he was talking about comes down to this phrase. Oh, I've got to get back to Revelation. I'm in Jeremiah. <clears throat> that time should be no more. I read the verse. At the conclusion of verse 6, here's what is what his what he is swearing about, what he's saying, this is true, and this is going to come pat is going to come to pass now. That there should be time no longer. Now that's not simply dealing with an end of time as you might think of it there. That, that's not what he's that's not what he's saying. We're going to see that right in our book of Revelation, you know, as in a sense where time continues. What he's saying is this what it means is there's time no longer. I mean God's delay is done. It's over with. That's literally what it means. His delay is done. <clears throat> no more delay. Now will be the end of all prophecy. Everything that had been talked about, God is saying through this, it's going to be fulfilled now. He's no longer delaying. His plan is now in motion. He is now acting. Again, man has been asking over and over throughout the years, why doesn't God intervene? This is when he intervenes. This is when he does say, it is enough. My plan is coming to fruition. I, 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 I'm done with this. This is it. I, I'm restoring everything back the way it should be. He's no longer delaying. The seventh trumpet will unleash all the events that lead to the coming of the Lord to the earth and the establishment of his kingdom. He says this in verse 7. Again, just more proof of what we're talking about. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel... When he shall begin to sound, dealing with that trumpet, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Think of the, how amazing this will be, what he's saying here. Everything that we've been waiting for, for what creation groaneth for. It's all, he said, this is it. This is the time now. That's why there's this massive symbolism that God is sending down through this incredible angel taking place. He's saying, listen, everything we've been waiting for from the very beginning of time, this is now the conclusion of my plan. Once that seventh trumpet sounds, it is rapidly going to usher in the literal kingdom on this earth. Well, Jesus Christ, God himself, will be reigning as Lord and King physically on this earth. Perfect government, perfect righteousness, all justice. Again, there have been certain truths that God kept at mystery until the time was right. We see Paul talk about that, Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. How mysteries get revealed by God. And you can't think of mystery like when you read, read a mystery novel here. It means something that's been closed. Something that's been hidden is now revealed. That's what it means by mystery here. Uh, again, it has a meaning of closed up. Here are some mysteries that were already revealed prior to this time, but for an amount of time, they were hidden from the world until the time was right. We see the mystery of Israel's blindness was hidden until Romans chapter 11, when it was now revealed. We see the mystery of the rapture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, being revealed. We see the mystery of Christ, Ephesians chapter 3. We see the mystery of Christ in you. Revealed in the New Testament. But now we have reference to the mystery of the finish of all things. Of all prophecy. 
again, dealing with the coming of the Lord's kingdom and all that it entails, the final judgment, the Lord becoming with His saints in His kingdom, and all that has been prophesied being made clear with understanding. And again, what unleashes this, what puts all this into motion, is going to be that seventh trumpet when it sounds. We are currently in this delay. We're not there yet. But again, I believe very soon God's delay will be over with. And when you think about that, because it's going to make sense as we conclude, that thought will bring sweetness and bitterness. The thought brings sweetness and bitterness. Okay? And that's why John is instructed to do next. It's a very interesting thing that he's asked to do right here. Ezekiel is asked to do the same thing, by the way. Dealing with similar prophecy. Very much parallels this, but we're not going to turn there. Verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel. I think that would just be incredible to see. <laughs> I'm having to approach this angel. He said, Give me the little book. And he said unto him, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So John is instructed by the voice of heaven to go unto the angel and eat the book. And he, again, he has to approach this amazing creature, which was, just would have been incredible of itself. And he asked the angel for the book. The angel gives it to him. The angel instructs him, you're to eat this. And he told him exactly how, how, how he was going to experience it from the sweetness and the bitterness and so John does, does just that. He takes the small book, and, it's, and, and, and again, representing the same book of Revelation chapter 5, and he eats it, and it's sweet. But as soon as he swallows it, it hits his belly. The bitterness hits. Why was it sweet to his mouth, yet bitter in his belly? The fact is, truth is always sweet to a believer. It always is. When you see God's truth revealed, you're always going to find that sweet. Psalm 119, 103. How God, God's truth is, is sweet as honey to our mouth. It provides a sweetness. You know, those times when you see God's truth clear and, and you have that sweetness that, it, that comes with it. That's what it's dealing with. This is representative of God's word that had been revealed to John. And now he takes it and he eats that truth. And he has the sweetness that comes with it. Truth is sweet and we love it. For instance, we want the Lord to return. There's a sweetness to it. But there's also a bitterness with it. We also have bitterness when we begin to understand God's truth. Boy, we're so excited about it when we have it. It's sweet in our mouth. But as you begin to digest it, comes understanding. With that understanding can produce a bitterness. Let me, let me, let me make it really clear. Go to Romans chapter 9. I'm going to see it. You're going to see this literally taking place with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, again, we, we think back to Philippians. I'm, you don't, don't turn there. I'm, I'm going to read there just for context to get into Revelation, Romans chapter 9. In, in Philippians chapter 3, when Paul was going over his testimony of his conversion, what he realized, the truth that he had in Christ, he talks about how sweet it was. He said, but what things were gaining me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done that I may win Christ. And he, and he goes on to talk about what he learned, learned about him, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and he goes on and on. He's dealing with the sweetness that he found in Christ, how it compared to nothing he ever experienced before. But in chapter 9, he deals with the bitterness that came with that truth. Look at verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. 
For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. See, what he realized is he had that truth. It was so sweet. But as he began to digest it and understand what it meant, his brethren were accursed from Christ. They were going to spend an eternity in a lake of fire. And he knew it. He had the sweetness of it. But there's a bitterness with it. And when, those, when that seventh trumpet sounds, you also, oh, there's a sweetness to it. It's everything straightened out. The Lord returns. But there's also a bitterness to it in what's coming. In the judgments when those vials are open, which is worse than anything the world has experienced yet. Even though we're, we're into th more than three and a half years into this now. What the Lord has to do in taking back and, and, and getting rid of all the corruption and all the evil with, through His holiness and His justice, yet mixed still with grace and mercy, what has to take place, it also produces a measure of bitterness. Not bitterness, again, as we think of it, it is with the difficulty of, of what is to come. And so there's a sweetness to truth. But as we digest it, we begin to realize all that that means. Again, we all long for the end in Christ's kingdom on the earth. But when we begin to meditate upon that, we begin to realize what else that entails. Judgment is going to fall. This is how this is going to work. And as a result of that, he, forms, he informs John in the, in, the, in the last verse there. He still had work to do. He says, listen, you're not done yet. He says, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And of course, John is elderly by this time. He's really close to his death by the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. But he is still prophesying before nations and every tongue and kings. As I mentioned to start this book, there are more commentaries written about the book of Revelation than any other book in the Bible. It is one of the most talked about books that there is, is this book. He is still prophesying before every nation, all the tongues, leadership of the world, by the what he saw and what he penned down. There was still work to do. And the same is true of us as we recognize the sweetness and the bitterness of what is to come. We still have much to do. There's still a lost and dying world that is facing these judgments that are going to hit. That's a reality. We have the truth. We know what is getting ready to take place. And the answer what they need to know is the gospel. That is the answer. And going out and proclaiming it with a, with a freshness and with a persuasiveness and with a passion... And knowing what is coming. But chapter 10 is the symbolism of what is getting ready to take place when the seventh trumpet sounds. And, as we, and we're going to get to that first. We're going to have another vision first of other things that are literally taking place. It's not symbolic when we come into chapter 11. But I, I'm, I'll, I'll be back in chapter 9 next Wednesday through the uh, finishing up the sixth trumpet. That was sort of an accident. I was halfway through studying chapter 10. I'm like, wait a second. I never finished the sixth one. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go back to that next week. But... As we continue this, we're going to get into the two witnesses and their ministry. It gives us some more information of these two men and what they were doing on the earth. So then we'll, we'll get into that as well here in about two weeks. All right, let's go with every head.